Hello, I'm Tim Smith, the pastor of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville, Tennessee. And wherever you're watching us from today, we're delighted to have you with us for this time of worship and study of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, the number one thing I get asked about by people is, when is the Lord going to return? I think it's only natural and human nature that we would wonder about that and be curious but of course, we do not know. Jesus says no person knows the day nor the hour, not even the angels in heaven. So if they do not know, of course, I nor anyone else could know. But that lack of ability to know has not stopped countless people from writing books on the subject. I know you can search YouTube and there are thousands and thousands of videos about it. But today, I do want us to look a little bit at what Jesus says about his second coming and what it will be like and what we maybe have to dread from it and also what we have to look forward to once the time of tribulation is past. I'm going to be reading uh, from chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew beginning in verse 3. When Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will this be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered them, Beware that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, all this but the beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will hand you over to be tortured, and will be put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away, and they will betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the... Uh, desolating sacrilege spoken of by the prophet Daniel, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one on the housetop must not go down and take things from the house. The one in the field must not turn back to get a coat. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For at that time there will be great suffering such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and produce great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Take note, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the eagles will gather. Immediately after the suffering of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. But about the day and the hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And may God bless the reading of his holy word and incline its hearing to our hearts and our minds and its application to our daily lives. Today, as we're thinking about the return of the Lord, one, of course, does not know when he is coming. 
It is uncertain, but we are told that we must be prepared for his return and that his return could occur at any time. Mindful of that, Jesus gives us some signs that we can look for, some things that we can expect to happen at, before his return. One of those things that is spoken of is that there will be a gradual or maybe rapid worsening of moral codes, ethics, and sin. That sin will reign and sin will abound and people will turn from God and God's ways. That there will be a great falling away in the church. Now, I remember 30 or 40 years ago, hearing the old time preachers get up and talk about, oh, how bad everything was then. How sinful the world was and how surely it could not be long before the Lord would return. Well, 30 or 40 years have passed and the Lord has not returned. But many of those that were alive then would be shocked by what we see today. Some things that have happened in the last few years are absolutely incomprehensible 30 or 40 years ago. Whether it's people's moral living, the values of our culture and society, the social strains that we see in our time, or whether it's just meanness that exists on the earth. You know, if somebody had told me that we would have to have armed security guards in our schools, 30 years ago, I would have never believed it. But it has come to pass, hasn't it? I was, uh, Shannon and I have been invited to come down to Columbia, South America, uh, to volunteer at a school there on a mission activity. And we were doing some research about it, and I was talking to someone, and they said, well, you know, it has a concrete wall around it. They have barbed wire around the school. And I thought, man, that's awful. That that's, must be a really bad place. But look around here in Lincoln County. We claim to be a Christian society. We claim to be this nice place to live. And it's not just us. It's everywhere. Our schools now have bulletproof glass in them. They have all kinds of security and surveillance cameras and security systems and armed guards in each school in our county. That's unbelievable. Well, I should say it's not unbelievable now because we know why it is needed. But in the past, if someone had told me that when I was a kid, I would say, you're crazy. That will never happen. We see it also with the values of our culture and society. We see people arguing and fussing about different things that one would have never imagined would have even been a topic of debate in the past. But that is how times have changed. And sadly, people are moving further and further away from Christ. That great falling away in the church is beginning to happen. Church attendance every year, every survey that I see always shows a decline. And sadly, that is probably going to continue. Jesus warns us of this, but in spite of our decline, we still have to remain relevant. We still have to remain uh, active and doing ministry and doing the work of Jesus Christ. Whether there are many of us, or whether there are few of us. But one thing that Jesus talks about here that I have a new appreciation for is lawlessness. He uses that term. The Apostle Paul also uses the term lawlessness in Thessalonians when he's talking about the Antichrist. He calls him a man of lawlessness. Anytime I have heard that, in the past, I have always thought this is a reference to chaos, disorder, riots, um, you know, bad crime. There won't be any law. Thinking about it from like a lack of law enforcement perspective, uh, as though it would be anarchy. Some of that may be so, but I think he's talking about a greater sense of lawlessness, a greater idea. Most of the time when the word law is used in the Bible, it's talking about the law of Moses. It's not talking about uh, the law uh, that's been passed by the Romans. It's talking about the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, our code of living. You know, any society you go to, no matter how primitive, uh, no matter whether they have uh, share our Christian values or not, every group has some sort of moral code. 
And about 90% of that moral code is the same. You're, you're not going to go to a society that and find that says, hey, murder's good, or that stealing is endorsed, or that lying is encouraged. That doesn't happen because that would break down society. However, today there is the idea out there, and we hear it everywhere, and books are being written on it. I'm sure if you searched on YouTube today, you could find a lot of videos about it. People that do not believe there is really a right and a wrong. It all depends on the circumstance. It all depends on your perspective. There's nothing black or white. It's all gray. Well, you know, some things are gray. Some things are very complicated and depend on circumstances. I understand that. But there is a such thing as right, and there is a such thing as wrong. And we have to remember that, whether we like it or not, or whether it's convenient to us or not. If you encounter somebody that tries to tell you there is no such thing as right or wrong, you watch that person very closely, because here's what's going to happen. Wait until somebody wrongs them and see if they don't start screaming about how they've been wronged. For the person that says lying's no big deal, wait till somebody tells a lie on them. See how loud they scream that that's wrong. For the person that says there's nothing wrong, wait till somebody steals something from them. To the person that says there's nothing wrong with uh, sexual sins or adultery and so forth, wait until someone um, commits adultery with them or on them, I guess would be the word, and see if they do not scream loudly how wrong that is. Yes, there are some gray areas, but there is also right and wrong. And the fact that we are seeing this idea that there is no such thing as right and wrong, that everybody can do what feels good to them and what they think is right, that is clearly a sign we are getting closer and closer to the end. Not only that, but we also have some other signs that we're growing nearer to the end. One of those is the number of natural disasters that we have. Jesus said that in the last days, there would be many natural disasters on a scale the world had never seen. He talks about floods. He talks about earthquakes. He talks about famines. All these things are going to take place. And we look around us and we see this happening. We have more storms than we used to. The storms are more severe than they used to, whether we're talking about the number of tornadoes here in the Mid-South, whether we're talking about the flood that happened a week or two ago in Death Valley of all places, whether we're talking about the drought out West that's been going on for years now. You know, when I was out in Colorado this summer, that's all anybody was talking about. That's all that was on the news. Climate change, the drought, is this the way it's going to be going forward? We're not, they weren't getting enough snow in the winter uh, to provide runoff for water. Um, up in the Rocky Mountains there, there are numerous reservoirs that have been built by Denver and Aurora and other cities to hold water uh, for the summer and the fall. I was out there in July 2019, and as I was driving through, uh, I drove by this one particular reservoir and it was appeared to me to be full, totally full. I went out in July of 22, this past July, and there were no telling how many acres that were just dry, dried up. That's part of the things we were seeing. We had record heat wave and record uh, drought in Europe. The Rhine River has gotten so low that you can't transport freight up and down it. These are the things that we are talking about. These are the things that Jesus was talking about. These are the things that we are seeing. And I find it interesting. Sometimes people try to argue about climate change, whether it's real, whether it's a fake. All I know is Jesus says in the last days, the weather is going to change. Things are going to be rough. There are going to be many calamities. And this is just yet another sign that the end is near. And this brings about some interesting uh, things that, bring about the return of the Lord and cause chaos in the last days because these droughts, these disasters, they're going to cause famine. And when people are hungry, uh, they become desperate. And that's when nation rises against nation. That's when one group fights with another. That's when neighbor fights with neighbor in an effort to uh, steal food from one another or to um, get the resources they need. 
when they are hungry or their children are hungry, we go to great lengths to fight and to struggle for those limited resources. And Jesus says it is going to bring about global war as has never been seen. And John talks about this. He says everybody's going to have to live in caves. You know, it almost sounds like everybody's going to be in bomb shelters. It's a very concerning thing. But it is in this chaos of little food, global war. Oh, and yes, we're told there's going to be a pandemic come through that kills one out of every three people. You know, we've seen how much chaos came out of this past pandemic. Just imagine one as deadly that it would kill one out of every three. It's in that setting, in that awful situation that finds people desperate that they are going to follow the Antichrist. And you know, I know people have always wondered, well, how would people be gullible enough to follow a false Christ? How would people be gullible enough to, to worship a person? Well, this Antichrist is going to bring order, stability, peace. He'll end the wars. He's going to put food in your belly. He's going to see that you get health care that you need, that you have a home and safety. And people will go to great lengths when they're in a desperate situation. And this person is going to come to power in that circumstance. Now, of course, we do not know when these things are going to happen, and we know it is very concerning just to even think about it. It's scary. I remember sitting in the pews and always being scared about it. Oh, I hope it doesn't happen in my lifetime. I hope it doesn't happen when I'm aware of it. But here's what we have to remember. Yes, it's going to be tough, but Christ says victory will be brought from it because it is then that Christ will return. It is then the full new world order will come about when we will see a new heaven and a new earth and full new life for us. It is going to be a great moment of victory for the Christian. For the non-Christian, it will be a time of darkness. But for those that have put their faith in Christ, it will be a moment of great victory. When death is defeated and sin is defeated and new life is given, Jesus warns us that it is going to be a rough time, but it will be cut short. He says it will only be for a short time. And he compares it to birth pains. Now, I know nothing about the pain of childbirth, and I do not want to know. I'm still traumatized for being even in the birth room when Skylar was born. Having said that, I've heard enough people talk about how bad it is to know it's extreme pain. Uh, I hear people compare it to a kidney stone or a kidney stone to it. However painful it is, we know it lasts for only a relative short period of time. It's awful, it's intense, but then it passes and new life comes about. Jesus says the same happens with his return. Yes, it's going to be painful, it's going to be rough, but only for a limited time, and then new life will come. You can go and talk to any mother, and they will tell you, yes, it was painful. Childbirth was awful painful, but bringing the new life into the world made it worth it. That's the way we should look at the return of Christ and the events leading up to it, for it truly will be a day of victory. For those of us that are Christians, we need to look forward to that day. We need to pray for the return of Christ and the establishment of his kingdom, and we need to be prepared because Jesus says no one knows when he's coming and that he's coming at an unexpected time. We need to have our hearts ready, our minds ready. There's not going to be a final trumpet blow. Hey, this is the 24 hour warning. We've got to be ready. And it is the same for the non-Christian. If you've never come to believe in Jesus, you don't need to continue to put that off because we don't know when the Lord is going to return. It could be today could be 500 years from now, but whenever he returns, we might need to be ready because it will be too late then. And whether Christ returns in our lifetime or not, we know something else is going to happen, and that is our life will come to an end. And when our life comes to an end, we immediately go and we'll have to stand before our master and give an account before God, just like we will if we're still living when Christ returns. 
We need to prepare for that and not put it off. Because when we delay too long, we get ourselves in trouble because it may be too late. Because we are not promised tomorrow. None of us are. We are only promised today. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for all the blessings of life. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to this world. We ask your blessing upon each person watching today. And pray, Lord, that you would help us to prepare our hearts and minds and our souls for your return. Help us to realize that you are always with us and will get us through any situation that we face. Forgive us of our sins and the times we have doubted you. Strengthen our faith and help us to serve you always until the day of glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Once again, I'm Tim Smith, pastor here at the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville, Tennessee. We'd love to have you come and worship with us in person. We have our 1030 a.m. worship service here in the sanctuary on Sundays. And at 8.30 a.m., we have our little bit more casual contemporary service in the Fellowship Hall. You'd be welcome to come and be with us at either one. And we're located about one mile north of the square at 1015 Lewisburg Highway. May God bless each and every one of you and hope you have a wonderful day.